This is actually a continuation of last week's message. I had titled last week's message, Live uh, Today Where You Want to Be uh, Tomorrow. And it was about kind of like judging yourself, examining yourself. We're going to take communion this morning also. So I asked Robert to, to hand out uh, all the communion. But we're going to go ahead and we're going to read this passage of Scripture uh, that we kind of ended with. This is where we were getting to last week. Uh, and uh, we've definitely read this passage of Scripture and I explained, but I didn't really get to the points because I kind of went off and started preaching on uh, how the message of the cross or the gospel was connected to what Paul was saying right here. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5 is what we'll read again this morning. It says, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yeah, I judge not mine own self, for I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified. But he that judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels, which means the purposes and intents of the hearts. And then shall every man have praise of God. So last week where we really started, this was the main passage that we were going to, we were moving towards. But where we started off was with two of the parables out of the book of Matthew. And what we talked about was the fact that we talked about that we ended with the parable of the virgins and then we went into the parable of the talents. And what I was doing was I was preparing the context for what I wanted to talk to you about. And in the parable of the virgins, <clears throat> what we know is that there were five wise ones and five foolish virgins, if you'll remember the story, right? And they were supposed to always have uh, what they needed in order in their preparation for when the bridegroom was going to come back. And they had to have oil and they had to have their lamps prepared because what we were told was that the bridegroom was coming back, that there was going to be a marriage. And the idea behind that of what the point that I was trying to make is, is that we know that the Lord's going to return. The word of God tells us that Jesus Jesus is coming back. Amen. And that in the meantime, we're in a temporary uh, time frame, if you will, where those that have chosen to believe the gospel, not everybody out there believes the gospel. Not everybody out there believes that God is real, that God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for us. Not everyone has been converted from their sinful life before in their first birth of Adam into uh, walking with the Lord. But we that have been born again or saved believe that Jesus is coming back. Amen. Jesus is coming back and he's going to establish his kingdom upon the earth. And, and not only that, not only is he coming back, because that's what we learned in the parable of the virgins, but also he's coming to settle accounts with his servants. That's what we learned in the parable of the talents. Because in the parable of the talents, he gave one five talents. Now, the word talent in the old King James, it describes money. But it's kind of an interesting thing because that word is outdated now. And when we use the word talent, we would think of what we have to offer, certain gifts that we've been given, if you will. And the reality is, is that God has given each and every one of us certain talents and gifts to be utilized for his kingdom. Amen. And what the story goes is that that the, that the owner of the land, he went on a long journey and he gave talents to his servants. Right. And then there was a time when he came back. So once again, Jesus is coming back and he came back to settle accounts with his servants. Right. And the account that he came to settle was so one of them that he gave five talents to, he produced five more. One of them that he gave three to, he produced three more. And the one that he gave one to, he just buried it in the ground because he was scared that he was going to lose it all. And what the Lord told him was, was that you who, who doubled the five and you who doubled the three, you've done well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with small things. Therefore, you're going to be a ruler of many things. And so what we get from that concept is, is that, yes, the Lord is coming back. And yes, he's going to settle accounts with his servants, but that when he establishes his kingdom on this earth, I don't know if you believe that or not. You know, sometimes when I try to think of things related to the kingdom of God from someone's mindset that doesn't really believe that it really seems 
far-fetched. It seems like such a fictional, you know, that, oh, you're telling me Jesus is going to come back one day and he's going to rule on a th the throne of David from Jerusalem? That's exactly what I'm telling you. That's what the Word of God says. Jesus is coming back one day and he's going to rule on the throne of David from the city of Jerusalem and all nations are going to come and bow to him, pay homage to him. The nations will exalt him. The nations will recognize. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's what the Word of God says. I've seen him change my change my life. I know he's real and I know that his word is right. Amen? Amen. And so he's coming back and he's going to settle accounts. And I don't, once again, I brought it up last week, but I don't know exactly how it looks, but I kind of quickly just said, well, you know, some of you might be mayors of cities and some of you might be governors of states. And, you know, I used to think of this guy, Lance Rao. Some of y'all know him. I've mentioned him before, but he was this guy that kind of blew through town, you know, and, uh, and he had this really long beard and he carried this cross down the road. That's why I started carrying a cross around. I wanted to be like him when I grew up. And so anyway, he carried this cross down the road. And I mean, look, when you meet him, you just want to pass him up on the street. I mean, especially like if you had like any kind of like pomp or circumstance with you and you, you didn't really want to deal with riffraff, you know, you'd never stop at the side of the road and talk to this guy, you know, because he was like hanging out with the prostitutes at the bars. Like he, you know, I say prostitutes, you know, like the strippers. I remember there was a story one time when he was over there by Amelia, over there by the Greenwood overpass and carrying the cross and he just kind of got tired. He happened to get tired right there. And so he stopped and all of a sudden all these strippers come out and they're giving him glasses of water. So this girl grew up in the church, she knew that when you give water to a prophet, that there's a blessing in that. And she ran in there. She said, hold on, don't leave. And she brought him some water. And he met him. So my point is, I used to think about that guy. And at first, I got to be honest with you, when I first met him, he used to come over to Mr. Paul's house. And I used to, I was, you know, I wasn't where I needed to be. And I used to just look at this guy and out the corner of my eye. And I used to think, hmm, who does this guy think he is? He's dragging his family all over the country. He, you know, there's no stability in their life. This is just ridiculous the way that he's living his life. That's, I'm just telling you what my carnal mind was thinking. I mean, I'm not scared to share with you the thoughts that I've thought before, okay? You might keep them, to, and you should keep them to yourself because most people will hold them against you. But, but anyway, that's what I was thinking. But you know what? when the Lord got a hold of me and he broke me down and he showed me what was in my heart. He showed me the way that I perceive certain things. I started thinking of old Lance Rowe and I started thinking, you know, he's just the kind of old boy that the Lord would let be a president Praise of a God. nation. You know what I'm saying? And because the kingdom of God is completely different than the way that we perceive it. Right? And so that was really the point that I was making last week. Jesus is coming back to, to this earth. Amen. Yeah. And he's coming to settle accounts with his, with his people. And so really, we got to live today where we want to be tomorrow and that we're taking an account, we're examining our own hearts, right? And so that's what Paul said right here in 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 5. He said, let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Now, last week, um, what we talked about was the fact that um, the, what was the mysteries of God? And that's kind of where I went off. And, and I used some scriptures to make the point that the, about the gospel of Jesus Christ, about the gospel of Jesus Christ and the message of the cross. And, and, I, and I use scripture to, to make the point that, uh, that th this is what the mysteries of God was, the message of the cross. Okay, and when and when the, the, some of the scriptures I used had to do with the fact that uh, Jesus, some of the words of the Lord, really I used all the words of the Lord, that just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so too must the Son of Man be lifted up. I used, I was trying to use scriptures that Jesus Himself said. I mean, we have so much information, whether from the writings of Paul, from the writings of Peter, from the writings of John. That really provide commentary for us. Deeper explanation of the words of Jesus, right? But if we just use Jesus' words, that's all I was trying to do. Is use Jesus' words to make a point for the gospel. That just as Moses in the Old Testament lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And if that would happen, then he would draw all men unto himself. And many times in the earth when I first got saved, I would think when we would sing that, it was a song like... Lift Jesus higher, lift Jesus higher, lift him up for the world to see. He said, if I be lifted up, 
From the earth I will draw all men unto me. Right? And I used to think, oh yeah, well let's lift him up. Let's get to sing him. Let's lift up the name of the Lord. But really I was misunderstood in that. I mean, don't get me wrong. When we lift him up, when we when we proclaim his name, he's lifted up. But, but really what he was talking about is I'm going to be suspended between heaven and earth. You're going to lift me up on this cross. And he was describing his death. That's what Jesus was talking about. When you lift me up. I'm going to draw all men unto me. And so that was the first thing. Jesus had to die. That was his whole purpose in coming. You know, we, we get, we get, I, I walked in the office the other day just to kind of mess with them because, you know, I, I work, I work with a lot of Catholic people and, but they kind of know what I stand for. And, you know, I had all these people telling me happy holidays and I just get, I, I'm probably overly critical, but I just get aggravated. And I'm just like, no, dude, don't say happy holidays up on my end of the clinic. You say Merry Christmas to Amen. Amen. So I told the, the office manager, because I'm always like kind of messing with him. Y'all, y'all know me a little bit. I get him I get him riled up a little bit. I said, hey, I just want to know something. Is it all right? The next time somebody tells me happy holidays, I said, oh no, ma'am. We don't say happy holidays on this end of the clinic. We say Merry Christmas because we love baby Jesus. You know, but really and truly, you know, I was trying to be a little bit funny, but it's not about baby, it's not just about baby Jesus, right? We see the incarnation of the Lord in that, the fact that he took upon flesh, but his whole purpose to come to this earth was to die on the cross. That was the whole point because man was in born in sin of Adam and he was separated from the presence of God. Therefore, God had to send his only begotten son to die on the cross to pay the to lay upon him the sin of us all, the infirmity of us all, the iniquity of us all. Each and every one of us like sheep have gone astray. And if you don't like that message right there, then you don't like the message of the cross. You don't like the message of the gospel that says every man born of Adam, born in sin, but God in his loving kindness had a plan. Amen. He had a plan to send the only begotten, the only sinless one, the only obedient one to die on the cross, to lift him up from the earth. That he might die for the sins of mankind. The next thing was John 14. You don't have to turn there. But I made the point that, that what would happen is that Jesus says that you know him. Talking about the spirit of God. For he dwells with you. He told his disciples that. He dwells with you. He, he, he had been dwelling with Israel. If you know the history of Israel, then you know that the presence of the Lord had been with them. Right? He was a pillar of cloud uh, by day, a pillar of fire by night. He was in Bezalel, which was the man who crafted all the articles of the tabernacle. The presence of the Lord had been with him. He split the Red Sea for the children of Israel. He protected them from all types of enemies and foes. Israel, that's what Jesus means when he says to his disciples, he's been with you. As a child of God, as, a, as an Israelite, the presence of the Lord has been with you. But he's going to be in you. He's going to be in you. How? Because when you lift him up. And then that message goes forth, and you believe by faith, a miracle happens. A supernatural miracle takes place where when your sin debt's been paid for on the ultimate sacrifice, the fulfillment of all the Old Testament sacrifices, because the blood of bulls and goats could not redeem mankind, could not take away sin, but Jesus as the fulfillment died, and when you hear that word and you put faith in that, now the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of you. You become the Old Testament tabernacle. You become the place where the Holy Spirit dwells and lives and resides and abides on a daily basis as you walk around on your journey in this life like one of those servants that's been given some talents in order to do the work of the Lord. Amen. The Holy Spirit's in you doing the work of God, doing the work of the kingdom on the inside of you and revealing the light of Jesus to a lost. I don't care what the what the scientific mind says. I don't care what the what the the those that are intelligent and philosophy. I've had so many conversations with so many smart people at, at festivals on the street. I'm tired of talking. You know, the other day my friend John sent me a message. I, I started watching this video. He said it was simple, but it was good. I said I'm starting to like simple. I'm, I'm trying to, I'm tired, I'm getting weary with trying to confound the wise. Yeah, they don't, you know, they're like, oh yeah, you got a good point there. I never thought about it that way, but then they still, they won't bow their knee. Lord, uh, you know, the, the, the simple gospel go forth. Change people's lives, Lord. Move upon people's hearts, amen. Let them see the truth. It's a, it's a simple message that God so loved the world that he sent the son. So he's going to live in you. But then also the last thing was that Jesus said in John 16, he said he's going to glorify me. 
He's going to take of what is mine and he's going to show it to you. Jesus is describing to his disciples, listen, there's going to come a day when it's all going to come together. The big picture is going to come together for you because the Holy Spirit's work is to reveal me to your heart. He's going to reveal the work of Jesus. There's a lot of times that you can't see it at first. People try to tell you about the gospel. They try to explain to you that Jesus died for you. And you're like, yeah, but, but guess what? If you will believe, if you will trust in the Lord, there comes a time when the Holy Spirit begins to reveal the work of Jesus, the work of Calvary. The fact that, listen, I can sit here and talk to you about it till I'm blue in the face. I can even, people laugh because sometimes veins pop out of my forehead. None of that's going to change anything. We need the Holy Spirit to take the word of truth and to call it to change the inside of our heart. You understand what I'm saying? When the word of truth enters into your heart, it begins to reveal to you yourself. That's what we're talking about this morning. Live today where you want to be tomorrow. An examination has to go forth. That's what Paul was talking about. Let every man take an account of us, of the mysteries of Christ, whether we be good stewards. See, just like in the parable of the talents where there were servants that were given talents and a reckoning took place, Paul calls himself a steward, which means basically a housekeeper, a servant that takes care of the house. The house that he's taking care of is the house of the Lord. Paul said, take an account of us. He said, it's not a big thing if man judges me. He, he said, I'm not really too caught, caught up in all that. I'm not too caught up in the fact that you Amen. might judge me. Just not. We're about to get into that in a second. I'm not too caught up in the fact that I can't, I can't even judge myself. He said, but the Lord's going to judge you. The Lord's going to judge the work. Just He's going to come back. He's going to do a reckoning and he's going to judge the work. The intent, the counsels. That's what the word was in the King James. The counsels of man's heart. What does that mean? The intents and the motives. God sees past what everybody else sees. We walk around with a veneer or a facade on the outside, an exterior that we show everyone, right? But God sees beyond that. He sees deep down in the midst of the heart. He knows exactly what the intents are. He knows, he knows, he dissects all that stuff. He knows the, 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 the heart of man, right? Because he knit it together while we were in our mother's womb is what he told the prophet Jeremiah. He put us together before even, before I even, before you were even in the womb. I had a plan for your life, Jeremiah. I know every inch, I know how many hairs you have on your head. You can't hide nothing from the Lord. I can't hide nothing from the Lord. He sees everything. He knows what your plans are. He knows your schemes. He knows what, why you make the decisions that you make. But he also knows the good in you. Amen? He also knows the parts of you that have a desire to serve him. And he knows how to cause all those things to work together. I guess I'm just trying to say you're not going to trick him. Amen? I'm not going to trick him. Mm -hmm. He know, And one day he's going to divide all that up. And he's going to do a reckoning of how his servants handled his business upon this earth. It's a whole lot of preachers that do a lot of things, but they're doing it for their own good. They're doing it for their own, you know, their own exaltation. They're, they want to be recognized by men. They want to get some people. Look, there's a whole lot of garbage in the modern church now where people are so prosperity minded that they're just trying to get rich off the gospel. Amen. But the reality of it is, is that we don't have to stress about that because God's going to separate all that out. Amen. He knows what he's doing. And he's going to filter it all out. Amen. So that was the mysteries. I believe that that's what the Apostle Paul was saying. I've been asked to be a steward of the house of God. To, to handle the mysteries of God. Which is the mystery of the cross. And I mean it really is a mystery if you think about it. I was thinking about it this morning when I was laying in bed. A prince that became a pauper. You know. I mean you think about kings. And you think about royalty. And what do you think? I mean I don't know. I think of. Snobbery. I think of, you know, silken clothes and nice mansions and yeah, white stallions and chariots. And you, you get the point that I'm trying to make. But God, the king of the universe, would send forth his son. The Bible says that he was, in essence, he was God. Jesus was, is God. He's the word that spoke the world into existence. But the book of Philippians says that to his form, which literally means his nature, he was God. But he humbled himself. He condescended. He became one of us. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 2 that because the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he became the same. He's your brother. He became your brother. So all for the purpose because, because God can't die. 
And so God became a man. He clothed himself with human flesh so that he could be a servant, so that he could be obedient unto God, even the obedience of the death, even the death of the cross. The prince became a pauper. You know, that was another thing Lance Ryle used to say. I don't know if Aaron remembers or not. But I'm like, Lance, finally, when the Lord got a hold of me, I'm like, I don't know why I'm talking about Lance this morning, but I'm like, Lance, what drives you, dude? I don't mean to be, this is, the, this is how he said it. Okay, maybe you would, it might turn your stomach a little bit. He said, well, it's kind of like if you could imagine some old boy that's been in jail, and uh, he got out of jail, and the first thing he did was he went and he got drunk so much so he had rags on his back and he just had he had puke all up in his beard and he was just sitting there on the side of the road and all of a sudden a man in a nice tailored suit came and sat down and put his arms around him and told him that he loved him and he was going to take care of him. He said, that's what Jesus did for me. I don't know if I can get that, get that, I don't, I think I'm doing a poor job of explaining, but all I can say is, is that sometimes our mindset and the way that we see other people is completely contrary to the way that Jesus sees people. Right. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. We think we got something figured out in our mind, and I'm here to tell you that the Lord is humble, amen? G G and he desires for his humility to, to be on the inside of our lives. As far as the points of this particular passage that I wanted to talk to you about that I never got to, point number one, if you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3, <coughs> point number one is what I put. I put, man will try to take an account and judge you unworthy. That's my first point. Man will try to take an account. Paul said take an account. Find out whether we are truly stewards of the mysteries of Christ. Now, one of the things that I pointed out to you last week also was I said that what does this have to do with me, though, preacher? I mean, Paul is a preacher of the gospel. This might have something to do with you, preacher. You've been called to stand behind a pulpit, but I have no. If you're a true disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you got a job. You got a job because you're like one of them servants that's been given some talents. You might not have been given five. You might have only been given three. You might have been given two. He's never going to ask more of you than what he's equipped you or prepared you to do. Nevertheless, he has equipped you and prepared you to do something. Right. So what is it that he's wanting you to do? He's wanting you to be a steward of this gospel message. He's wanting you to allow the light that's been placed in you to shine in the midst of darkness. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. He was the light that came from heaven that God sent. But he says in Matthew chapter 5 that you are the light of the world. Well, who's you? The disciples. Well, I'm not a disciple. Yeah, you are. The scripture says a disciple is a learner of Christ. If you've given your life to the Lord and you desire to learn of him, then that's exactly what you are. You are a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So the apostle Amen. Paul wants to know we need to take an account. I want you to find out whether or not I've been a proper steward. Well, in the process of taking an account, i got to tell you that there's times when you're desiring to be a steward for the mysteries of Christ, a steward for the Lord, that there will be men that take an account of you and they will judge you unworthy. There's going to be times in your life where we, like Paul, want to be good stewards of this mystery and we will face opposition for it. But Paul understood that man's judgment only means so much because man's heart is faulty. Mankind will look at you down his religious little nose and he will compare the, the acts that the actions that you show forth and compare them to. Listen, I know very really well that there's and, and you know what? Everybody every right. When you stand up behind a pulpit and you and you desire to be a preacher of the gospel, then there's going to be people that are going to determine things in their heart about you. And I, and I get all of that. But once again. The heart of a person that's judging me faulty, the Lord's going to figure all that out. See what I'm saying? But not only the preacher, but also you. There's people that look down on you because maybe they don't like the way you dress. Let me tell you something. That is so superficial. I can remember one time, I'm just being honest. That is so superficial. And you know, I'm this, men probably do it too. I remember one time Robert and them clown me. <laughs> Robert and Sean, we can take this on the film. Robert and Sean clown me when I first time I wore them jeans and had some threads on the pockets. And you know what? I used to clown people too. 
My point is, is that we got a certain mindset in our head of what we think looks right and what we think looks wrong. I can remember back in the day when I lived in Lafayette, the first time I saw an old boy with some that little jabot ch ch on his jeans, you know, that little tag that he used to have on the front, dude, I clowned that boy so bad. And I mean, you know, who was I? I mean, this dude was cut from a millionaire family. Maybe I just didn't like the fact that he had money. I don't know. My point is, is that that's so superficial, right? I mean, really, truly, dude, think about it. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son to die on the cross, to bleed naked, hang naked in the midst of shame, to take your sin upon him, to die for you. And we're over here judging somebody's outfit. That's right. Oh, Lord, help us. Our hearts are hard. Our hearts yeah. are cold. The preacher's probably the worst one in the house because I'm over here looking at people. I wouldn't wear that. You probably look, what, what is this vest thing you got on? I don't But look, you might not wear it, but guess what? I thought it looked good this morning, so I put it on. My point is, is that it's superficial, man. Yeah. It's going to burn up. Yeah. It's silliness. What are we getting caught up in? But... Man will try to judge you, and he's going to judge you based off of the wrong stuff. That's what I'm trying to say. He, he, he's making his determination, and it's not even the right thing. As a matter of fact, the Lord told, told the prophet in the Old Testament, I always get it mixed up, whether it was Nathan, but it was Samuel, I believe. And He told Samuel, he said, he said yeah, it was Samuel. Nathan came out. He said, why do you mourn for Saul? Fill up your horn and go anoint one of Jesse's boys. Amen. And he said, get up. Quit mourning for Saul. And go anoint me one of Jesse's boys to be the next king. And he said, when you do, don't look at his external appearance. Don't look at his stature or his external appearance. Oh, you're going to see a good-looking young man of Jesse's boys. You're going to see a tall one that looks like he should have been Saul in the next king. Don't look at that because man looks at the outward appearance and I look at the horn. I'm here to tell you right now, we should be convicted in our hearts whenever we sit here and we judge people from an external appearance, especially when it comes to fashion. That's ridiculous. But I'm just saying, too, listen, sometimes people act a certain way and we think to our, in our religious hearts. Listen, every last one of us in this room deal with this. And you know how I know? Because the enemy is constantly trying to make us self-righteous. Right. The enemy wants us to be self-righteous and not understand the righteousness of Christ. And so we look down our religious nose on the actions of other people and we determine in our hearts that they're not right and that, and that we're right because I don't do what they do. I used to do that, but I don't do that anymore. I'm free. <laughs> that, that person's still struggling with that. Well, yeah, they are. But if you really had the compassion of the Lord, you'd sit there and you'd be sacrificial towards them because that's what Jesus did. He was selfless and he loved. He gave his life so that we could live. Amen. All right, so you can be rest assured that man will judge you unworthy. There's times that you're gonna take that you're gonna take a stand for the Lord, and people are gonna look down on you. At times, people will take an inventory of your life and question whether you are really a steward of the Lord. And sometimes, much of what they say is gonna be hurtful. Can I just let you in on a little secret? That there's gonna be times that people are gonna say things to you that are gonna hurt. There's gonna be times that you're gonna talk to people in the church. And things that they're going to say to you are going to hurt. Because they're going to tell you, because guess what? Sometimes they're going to tell you the truth. That's right. I like people that tell the truth. Mm -hmm. I, sometimes I don't like it right at first. Mm -hmm. and you got to kind of learn how people are too. People have different kinds of personalities. Do you understand what I'm saying? Somebody says something to you. Look, if, if I, listen. If everything that I heard that people said about me or did towards me, if I allowed that to strike a, a root of bitterness in my heart, I wouldn't talk to hardly nobody. I'm just saying. I'd be done. Done with you. Back in the old days, I'm done. I ain't got, you, you're wasting my time, man. I'm moving on. I'm going to find somebody else that, that I can have fun with, that I can chill, that whatever. But no, 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 no. That's not the Lord. So, so the point that I'm trying to make is this, is that sometimes in the body of Christ, we got this is a family. This is a family, right? And how, let me ask you something. You don't have to raise your hand, but how many people in your family, they get on your nerves? I'm just saying, watch it, Brother Paul. Be careful back there, buddy. That's my father. Don't let him get to talk. How many people in your family get on your nerves? You know what I'm talking about. Little sisters, little brothers, mamas, daddies, in-laws, whatever, whatever, right? But, and listen, every family is kind of dysfunctional. But what I'm just trying to say is, is that 
when you've matured a little bit, you start to look past people's faults, yeah. right? Amen. I mean, okay, they get on your nerves, but you love them. Yeah. Same thing in the body of Christ. There's going to be people that get on your nerves. But if you're not able to love them, then the problem resides in you, bud. Yes. Not in them. See, because God's either working on them or, or they don't want him to. That's between them and the Lord. Or God's either working on you or he's not. Then the question is, is that just because somebody else got on your, on your nerves, if you're not able to love them, the problem resides with you. You got to let the Lord work in your heart. You got to let the Lord do a work in you. But let me just say this. Sometimes people are going to make an account of you. Sometimes they're going to say things, especially people in the church. And sometimes it's going to be hurtful. But can I tell you that sometimes it's true. Sometimes what they're saying is true. Um, and, and you just and you got to let the Holy Spirit reveal to you what is truth, what he can use. Now, sometimes the reason that they do it is to hurt you. But it doesn't mean that what they said wasn't true. I've learned that, man. Listen. Sometimes people say things to me, and right when they say it, I'm just like, oh. But then later on, I'm like, okay, Lord, I've learned to do this by the grace of God. I didn't just wake up one morning and get this revelation. But I started to say, okay, Lord, how can you use that in my life? What do I need to see in my life? Because surely I'm not, I'm not everything I think I am. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Surely there's some stuff in me that needs to be dealt with. So is there some truth to what that person said? Right? And whenever I do that and I reflect, I take an examination. That's what, that's what Paul said, take an account. Really that word means inventory. To, to, to take an inventory of what's going on and to come to the proper conclusion. So one of the things that I wanted to say is, is that, well that was number one. Man will try to take an account and judge you unworthy. And Paul said this, he said, but with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. That's what 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 said. Paul said that. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. I know people are going to judge me. I know people are going to make a determination about me. But in the grand scope of things, sometimes what they say might be true. But in the grand scope of things, it's a very little thing that you might judge me. You might think a whole lot of bad stuff about me, but when it's all said and done, there's very little that you judge. Why? Because Paul had a picture that was bigger than that, right? Point number two, your own heart can't be the judge either. Now, this is coming right out the lips of the Apostle Paul. Look at this. 1 Corinthians, we're in verse 3, the second part of verse 3, but also verse 4. And this is what the Apostle Paul said. We're going to let you get that up there real quick. What is it? 1 Corinthians 4. This is what he says. He says, uh, go back to the go back to the first one. For, go back to verse three. Okay, verse four. I'm sorry. Yeah, verse three. I want verse three up there. He says, but with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. And then he says right, this right here, that last part. Yea. I judge not mine own self. I, people aren't, people aren't going to... But what, I don't understand. Your, your whole premise of your message this morning is to take an account of your own life. I thought you wanted us to... Hold on. Slow down. Paul's making a point here. We're going to get to that in a second. But right now, Paul's making a point. Then when you go to verse 4, this is what he says. He says, For I know nothing by myself. In other words, when I look at my own heart and my own life, I can't see anything going on. Now that's not, I'm not telling you that's the preacher. I'm telling you that's the apostle Paul. I mean, he's the one, remember, that took five beatings on his back with whips and three beatings with rods and, and was stoned and left for dead and shipwrecked and, uh, and imprisoned for the gospel. What Paul's saying is, I, I do try to take an account of my life. I do an inventory, right? And, and I, but guess what? I don't see anything. But look what he says. Yet, am I not hereby justified? Just because I don't see anything in my life that is not what justifies me. That is not what makes me righteous in the eyes of God. Your own heart cannot be the judge of the thoughts and the intents and the motives of your heart. Your own heart cannot be the judge on whether or not you are a good steward of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul says, hey, this, is, this is not what justifies me, but he that judges me is the Lord. 
You know, oftentimes I've said this many, I've said this many times that I go walk, walk around in public and I see these people with these shirts or tattoos that says, you can't judge me, only God can judge me. That, that, that tattoo irritates me so bad. And you know why it irritates me so bad? Because it's, it's written on the body permanently of people that don't believe in the Lord. And the reason that they have that written on their body is because they don't want you calling into question anything that they're doing. But I got bad news for the unbeliever. He is going to judge you. That's the whole point. Because of the fact that Jesus took your judgment on him, but you refused it, you will be judged. And if you don't receive the love and the forgiveness of Christ through the shedding of his blood, you're going to stand naked and guilty before him, and you will be condemned. That's what the Bible says. But it's not God's fault. No, instead you refused to go his way. He will judge you. But this is what it's talking about right here. Paul's talking about, I leave the judgment to the Lord. He's going to judge the thoughts, the intents, the interior. He's going to scrutinize. He's going to dissect. He's going to examine what was really going on inside. Once again, it's not that Paul was recommending that we never take an account of our own lives. As a matter of fact, we're about to get to that in a second in the next passage. But he's saying that when he looks at his heart, he doesn't personally see where he has been a bad steward. Nevertheless, that doesn't justify him. The Bible teaches us that man cannot know his own heart. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Now, in this passage of Scripture, I have to tell you that there's a specific context, and we'll go through it real quick, but it says, Now the Spirit, talking about the Holy Spirit, <coughs> speaks expressly. In other words, when the Apostle Paul wrote this to young Timothy the pastor, he said, the Holy Spirit is telling us something's going to happen. And there's no question whether it's going to happen. And what he's saying is that in the latter times, some are going to depart from the faith. Now, I got to tell you that this word depart means that you were once going in a certain direction and then you quit going in that direction. Now, you can do whatever you want with that theology. I'm just here to tell you that's what it means. You were previously traveling one way and now you're traveling another way. Does that mean the whole church or does that mean individuals? They're going to depart from the faith. They're going to give heed to seducing spirits. Now, this is different. This isn't the Holy Spirit. This is demon spirits. Demon spirits uh, affecting the message that preachers preach. Give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. The word doctrine means instruction. That's what it means. The doctrines of death. Demon spirits changing the gospel that's preached from behind the pulpit, resulting in people actually departing from the faith. They still think they're in the faith, but they're not really in the faith anymore. The Apostle Paul told us the Holy Spirit said that in the end days, this is what was going to happen. And speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. This is one of the reasons. Now, granted, the, the context here specifically relates to people who have been hypnotized, for lack of words, by a demonic, devilish doctrine that has caused deception and confusion and caused them to depart from the true pathway of God. But what happened through it all was that their conscience was seared. So I need you to know that your conscience can be seared. The word conscience describes uh, the, your own witness. You know, I used to love the way Lauren Larson used to say this, that God stamped his copyright in the heart of every man. It's almost like if you could see a factory of human beings being created. And God's stamping a conscience on the each side, on the inside of every one of them. Because see, when we're first born of Adam, we're not born in relationship with God. You might say to yourself, oh, but that precious little baby, he's so cute. He is cute, but also Lauren Larson, I ain't trying to copy, take, take the credit for his stuff. I used to love when he'd say that. Put two 18-monthers in the same crib with one rubber ducky, back up and watch what happens. You didn't have to teach him that. And the foolishness is bound up in the heart of the child. You let them have their own way, they're going to do whatever it is that they want to do. They will rule the house. But the point is, is this, is that God will, has placed a conscience on the inside of them, on the inside of their interior. You, you ever seen a situation whenever you're trying to talk? Kids know stuff. Yeah. Uh, like you over there sitting there talking or they're observing. I, I don't know. Look, I am so observant of kids. 
because I can't stand when a kid don't act right. I'm just looking to bust them all the time. Like, I'm telling you this how I am. I'm sorry. I mean, when I say bust, I'm going to mean catch him. I, don't mean, I ain't going to whoop you, kid. Don't worry. But what I'm saying is, I don't know why I am that way, but I am. And I'm just like, oh, I'm watching their eye movements, their lip movements. I hear stuff that they say from across the room. It's crazy. I don't know if it's a curse or what, but I know I like, oh, what almost every kid's doing. I even told Troy something about, you know, a little, little girl like yesterday. I knew what she was up to, but, but it's because I've been watching them so long, okay? And what I'm trying to say, though, if you watch a kid's face, they know whenever something went right. They might sit there and lie, but if you watch their eyes, they got like a little twinkle in their eye, and they knew that what they did was wrong. That's the conscience. The moral aspect of the soul of man that tells him, makes him aware of things that are, that are right versus wrong. The problem with the conscience is that it can become seared. I'm here to tell you that the smartest evolutionist scientist that's ever walked the face of the earth, at some point in time in his life, God stimulated that moral compass on the inside of him, and he knew in his heart that there was something bigger than him, that there was something intelligent that designed all of this, and he knew that there was a God in heaven, but he convinced himself, and through the ages, and through the stages, and through the days, he allowed his heart to become hard, and he allowed out his conscience to become seared to the point where he convinced himself that God never even existed. I'm here to tell you that God has given every single man a conscience and it's that part in the human soul that is aware morally of right versus wrong. It's, a, it's an awareness in yourself of what is right versus wrong. That's only helped Built up and edified the more you know the Lord. The, when the Holy Spirit lives in you, it's, it's revealed to you even more. The more of the word of God you know, it helps to increase your compass. It helps to increase your direction. Amen? Amen. The second thing was Jeremiah 17. I'm just trying to make a point. J, Paul said, I can't judge my own self. Just because I don't see something in my life, that's not what justifies me. Just because you think you handled your situation right doesn't mean it was right in the eyes of God. All right? Just because you think you have a right to do whatever it is that you're doing in another person's life because of the way they treated you, that doesn't mean that that's the way the Lord would have you to do it. But you'll convince yourself. And many times we rob ourselves of the blessing of the Lord. God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. Amen? I've experienced that a couple times in my life. Doesn't mean I don't need to experience it every day because Lord knows pride still definitely trying to rise up in my heart. But there's been times when the Lord has revealed things to me and I'm like, I've even talked to other people and I'm like, this is what I feel like God wants me to do. And they're like, you must be crazy. Why in the world would you do that? Why would you call that man up and tell him that you said something about him and he was 40 miles away and he ain't never going to know because then people don't even know him. <laughs> Because I can't get this thing off my back. <laughs> and I love the Lord. And I love his presence. And I just feel like if I don't do this. Then I'm not going to be able to hear his voice. And, and it may not make any sense to the logical mind. All right. But look. The heart can become hard. The conscience can become seared. That's what I'm trying to tell you about this morning. Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10 says. The heart is deceitful above all things. And desperately wicked. Who can know it? Look what the Lord says. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins. That's old King James for the innards. God says, I'm the one that's putting the test the inside of man. To give, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Man doesn't really know his own heart. I know. I'm searching and dissecting and looking deep within. And he says, I, because I want to give according to every man according to his doings. Man can't really know his own heart because his heart can become hard, his conscience can become seared, and he can be deceived, but God judges the heart of man, and that brings me to point number three. God will judge the heart and work of man. And you know what? He's going to do it the right way. Amen? Aren't you glad for a merciful judge? Aren't you glad for a righteous judge? Praise God. Aren't you glad the preacher ain't going to judge you in the end? I sure am glad some of y'all ain't going to judge me. Amen. I'm so thankful for the righteousness of the Lord, for his humility and his selflessness. Amen. Amen. 
God will judge the heart and the work of man and he will do it the right way. Let's look at verse 4 again of 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We're also going to look at verse 5. But we'll start with verse 4. <coughs> He says, For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified. But he that judgeth me is the Lord. Verse, next verse. It says, Therefore judge nothing before the time. He says, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the, until the Lord come, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. Now, let me just say this. There used to be preachers in the past that used to say, <coughs> this is how they preach, use this scripture. They'd be like, I'm here to tell you. I remember going to a men's meeting one time. I know Robert came to that men's meeting and Sean said, I ain't never going back to that, to that place again. And I don't blame him. I wanted to stand up and it was the church I was going to. I was in leadership over there. I wanted to stand up and say, dude, that is not, that is false doctrine. Why I didn't do it, I, whatever. I was already had called him out so many times I was getting tired. But what he did was, he, he stood up there and he said, there's going to be a video camera in heaven. And the Lord's going to show that time when you was looking at that girl's backside and you wasn't supposed to be looking at it. He's going to call you guilty, you over here thinking you trying to walk right with the Lord. There's a video camera, got everything you ever did wrong on it. And you're going, you know, and I'm like, well, you see, well, that's not what the Lord's talking about right here. They ain't no, they ain't never seen one time when the scripture said there was a video camera <laughs> in heaven where he would, God ain't one to call you guilty. He's one to call you righteous. Amen. That's why he sent his son Jesus to die for you on the cross. Amen. God's one to make you right with him. He's one to give you new life and new hope. Mm -hmm. What Paul's talking about is the works of men's hands. He's talking about the works and the motives from which they did what it was that they did. God's going to separate all that out. And the things that were done the wrong way, he is going to allow it to be revealed. I don't know that you're all going to know everything that I did wrong, but I do know one thing. Me and the Lord's going to know. Amen. The Lord's going to say, you sure didn't think you were clipping along at a good place right here. And you just thought your motives were so pure before me when you did this, that, or the other thing. But look at this right here. Look at that right there. Boom. No, you were in that partially for yourself. It doesn't mean you lose everything, but instead of two rubies, you get one on your crown. <laughs> you get the point. And we're going to give the crown back to Jesus anyway. But it said right here that he's going to make, he's going to manifest the counsels of the hearts. Then shall every man have praise of God. Because see, part of that, this is what you call the judgment seat of Christ. You can get into that and study some of that on your own. Two different kinds of, of judgments. One's the great white throne judgment where those that are condemned by God are going to face the penalty of eternal death. But then the judgment seat of Christ where the works of men's hearts are going to be judged by God. And there's some of it that's going to be straw and hay and stubble and it's going to get burned up and it's not going to last. But some of it is going to last. And then men will receive praise from God for the work that they did for him. But you can't judge me just like I can't judge your work. But guess what? God's going to judge it and he's going to sift through it. He's going to come to the, he's coming back again to do a reckoning with his people. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So we do have a part to play and we need to take an inventory. We're now we're going to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. <clears throat> and this is, uh, this is the famous communion passage that the Ap Apostle Paul used when he wrote this letter to the uh, church in Corinth. And I just want to kind of give you real quick a little bit of a, a, a background of what's going on. So there were both rich people and poor people in this church. And you remember how we were talking about rich people or when that how I was judging old Lance in my heart because of the way he looked and how other people would have probably judged him, you know, or you ever, <coughs> you know, some snobby people in your life before, right? Haven't you? Surely you have. I know I've known a lot of snobby. I know snobby people that didn't even have a reason to be snobby. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm just saying, dude, it's for real. Like, they, they acted like they were rich and they really didn't have that much money. And they acted like they were beautiful and they weren't really that pretty. I'm just, I'm just being honest. Look, you don't, don't, look, I can judge it too. I'm just saying. You walk around here like you all that and you ain't really all that. I don't understand. Why are you acting like you all that? 
right? But y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all seen snobby, right? And that's and that's what people do. They being snobby, right? And so, <laughs> but that's what we had in Corinth. We had some snobby folk. They were rich, but they also had some poor folk. Well, the thing of it is, is this, is that when the gospel enters inside of your heart, what it's really supposed to do is supposed to change all that. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that when old girl walks up in the place and she got on that outfit that looks silly to you, that you can't still see that. But instead of like clowning her when she's not there, and I'm, I've done it too. But instead of clowning her when she's not there, like your, my heart should really be more like that poor girl. And, and, I mean, and I mean this seriously. I know it's going to sound the wrong way, but I mean this seriously. That poor girl thinks that her outfit looks good, but everybody's making fun of her in their mind. Lord, I pray that you'd minister to her. And, you know, whatever. I'm just saying, I know it's something silly about an outfit, but you get the point. It shows you the motives of people's hearts. You get the point that I'm trying to make? And, and so that's what's going on in Corinth is you have people that are snobby and rich and they're looking down on the poor and they don't want to have anything to do with it. It's almost like a clique that you can have cliques in church. I've been in churches that are big enough they have cliques. And, oh, why don't you go to this life group over here because this is the couple that's handling that. I'm like, dude, I'd rather go to this one over here to be perfectly honest with you because all the people over there are like the people in Corinth. Let me go to hang out with these people. I just ain't got time for them. I don't want to be around people like that. They get on my nerves. They always have and they always will. Even though I probably, maybe because I see my own self in some way. But, but what I will say is this, is that that's what was going on. And so what would happen is, is that they were supposed to come together. It was called the love feast. They'd come together. They'd bring food. They'd eat. They'd drink. And guess what? Then they would celebrate the Lord's Supper together. And it was supposed to be a time of unity. It was supposed to be a time of selflessness. It was supposed to be a time of reflection and remembrance on what the Lord had done and how he had, had given his life so that they too could have life. But what was happening is, is that the rich people would say, okay, so we told everybody else that the, that the service was starting at seven. But listen. You folks over here, I want you to know we're going to start at 6, all right? So you show up at 6, and you bring all the good stuff that you got from your house, and then when the other folks, the riffraff, show up, we will have already had been started on this thing real good, and we will have, you know, we will have appeased ourselves with, with our joyous festivities. <laughs> and so what would end up happening is, is that the poor folk would show up, and there was hardly nothing left. And they were over there on one side of the room, left all by themselves to feel denigrated, to feel less than. And the pomp over here, like, hmm, if you would have known. And they all like, they all know. They all know in their head, yeah, we planned this, man. We told y'all to show up at 7 and we, we showed up at 6 and, and we ate all the good stuff. And look at you poor, pitiful people. Now, is that Jesus? No, that's not Jesus. That's the devil. Trying to make people feel bad, make people feel condemned, make them feel unworthy. They don't even want to come to church next week. And the Apostle Paul uses this communion passage to rebuke them. That's what he's really doing right here. He's rebuking those people that are treating other people improperly. Look at this, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 33. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. Talking about the gospel. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread... And drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. You know, we're going to take communion this morning. I know that Aaron and I were eating the other night, and he shared with me that he had been studying this. And, uh, and that word, and I looked it up this morning, it describes a proclamation. Every time we take communion, we're proclaiming the, the mystery of Christ. We're proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're proclaiming the fact that he died for our sin and that he was buried but we're also proclaiming the fact that he's coming back again. Amen. He said, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. 
So every time we do this, we're remembering his death, but we're also remembering the fact that he's coming back. And when he comes back, he's going to settle accounts with his servants. Amen. He's going to dissect all the works and he's going to give praise unto men. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Now, I don't know if you've been taught a particular thing in the church, but I got to tell you that that word unworthily is an adverb. It's not a noun. It doesn't, it's not saying you're unworthy. It's saying that there's the possibility that you could take the Lord's bread and, and the elements unworthily. All right. Now, communion is for sinners that have been saved. What I'm trying to say is, is that each and every one of us have stuff in our life that the Lord is working on in each and every one of us. But it's Jesus' blood that makes us right with God to begin with. It's his sacrifice on the cross that made us right in the eyes of God. So communion is for people like us. But when we take communion, we can take it unworthily when we don't rightly discern the Lord's body. What does that mean? The church of Corinth wasn't rightly discerning the Lord's body. There are, the, the, the rich folk are over here clowning the poor folk and they over here being selfish instead of selfless. And their hearts aren't right. Right? They're not reflecting on their own lives. They're not, re they're not realizing and, and, and reflecting on the magnitude of what this whole thing is remembering, uh, is reminding us of. Of the fact that God sent his only son to die for us. And, and how severe and serious that situation is. He says, for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. You have, to, you have to make a discernment about what this means. Now, we're not trying to get overly religious and turn this into transubstantiation. That's not what we're doing. That's not what we do. But we're preaching the gospel and being reminded of the, the severity and the seriousness of, of what God's plan has done for us. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. This is the main part I wanted you to see here. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. This is another spot where when Paul talked about taking an account, looking inwardly, you know, retrospect, taking a look on the inside of his own heart and his own life, you know, that's what, if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. See the difference between the child of God and the world? He said even when you are judged, even when the Lord reveals things to you, the whole purpose that God has behind it was that you had to be chastened. Like a loving father would chasten his child. That, you know, you do know that godly discipline is a, that proper discipline is a godly thing. Amen. Amen. You chasten those whom you love. God chastens his children. You don't, you don't whoop a kid because they got you mad and you're angry. You just ain't. No, you, you take care of business today because if you don't, you're going to have a disaster tomorrow. God has the wisdom to know if I don't deal with Matt today, tomorrow is destruction. Same thing for you as a child. Your kid doesn't know any better, but if you don't deal with it today, man, you're going to have a mess tomorrow. So he chastens us so that we wouldn't be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. Just wait a little while. Don't be telling them to show up at 7 and you showing up at 6. Wait for them. You know, the words for judging in this passage come from the same root as the word of judge in the other passage of Corinthians where Paul was saying man can't judge me and I can't completely judge my own self but what they have in common is the idea of investigating and making a determination looking inwardly the word examine is a different word but it has a similar meaning to scrutinize or to put to the test and while we often use this passage once again to serve communion the main idea here is that Paul is bringing correction because the people in Corinth are acting completely opposite of what the whole meal represents. Communion is a meal of unity that remembers the selfless love of the Lord. Instead of selfless love that would result in unity, they are selfishly taking for themselves and it's resulting in division. I mean, this is a word that each and every one of us can receive this morning, I believe. Every last one of us knows and deep in our hearts 
that we've done some of the similar things to what I've talked about this morning. <clears throat> the take home message is that God's kingdom requires his business to be taken care of his way. And when the message of the cross enters our lives, it will cause change to our actions and produce a desire in us to do things his way. Therefore, we should judge or investigate ourselves. It's, the gospel is going to enter in with the help of the Holy Spirit. It's going to change us. It's going to change the motives of our heart. You know, when the Lord puts something on your heart to do something, and then later on you don't feel like you really wanted to do it, guess what? That doesn't mean that the Lord didn't tell you to do it. Right? You, 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 and sometimes that's whenever the trial starts. That's when you got to hold on to the Lord to trust Him in the midst of the trial to continue to be faithful till He's called you, till He frees you up from that situation. He was long suffering, amen, for us. Just a couple of quick things and then we're going to take communion. They were consumed with their own interests and were unaware of the feelings and needs of others. That's pretty serious stuff. That ought to be for every teenager or a young, young person in here that ought to hear that. Maddox, you promised me you listen. You need to hear that. What did I say? They were consumed with their own interests and were unaware of the feelings and needs of others. What does that mean to Maddox? That means that if some dude shows up at school with pants like this, that you don't clown that dude. Come on, Maddox, help me out, bro. I know my school, my pants are already a little bit. You don't clown him. I know sometimes it's all in fun, but that's the point that I'm trying to make. Right? Sometimes we're so concerned about our own interests that we don't look at the interests of others. And the truth is, is that just think about it like this, though, for real, that, you know, I'm just saying, like, I'm using Maddox and picking on him because he's always clowning me and I clown him. And we just we got that little relationship like that. And it's all cool because I don't mind him clowning because I'm not really that worried if he thinks that my pants are too high. It's not going to change my life in the least. I know, you know, understand what I'm getting at, but there's somebody else that it can affect. There's somebody else that it might really affect. Because it wasn't just Maddox that said it, but it was this one that said it, it was that one that said it. And each and every day they're hearing the same thing and they're getting worn down. And see, really and truly, the light of God is in Maddox. Right? He's in you, he's in me. And what God wants to do is he wants to allow that light to come out and to shine into other people's life, to give them hope. Because they don't have hope. Amen? So, they, so the people in Corinth were worried about their own interests and were unaware of the feelings and needs of others. God wants you to be aware of the feelings and needs of other people. Yeah. Amen. He wants you to quit hurting them and tearing them down. He wants you to help them. Amen. They weren't properly, number two, they weren't properly discerning the Lord's body. Once again, the same word that means judge to, me, to, to make an investigation. And when you have the right understanding of what the cross means to you, it will begin to change your mindset about others. Amen. Because it's supposed to kill the old man that we were. Right. <laughs> and bring resurrection life to a new man that looks more like Jesus and less, less like we used to look. Ultimately, it's going to change you. And in this case, they were rich and looked down on the poor and ate and drank all the provisions for communion. A change for them, <clears throat> I like this one, a change for them would have looked something like a change that happened to Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. Oh, yeah. Hmm? What does that even mean? Well, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea were both Pharisees that were rich and had a lot of money. The Pharisees were the religious sect of, of Israel that were in political leadership and were very wealthy. But two of the people that were over there taking the bloody body of Jesus off the cross and begging Pilate to be able to have his body were the two rich Pharisees whose hearts had been changed by the gospel Praise of Jesus God. Christ. Praise God. Giving this man who looked like a pauper to the, to the regular folk their own tomb that would have been very expensive and, and probably provided, I would imagine, all of the, the needed elements to, to embalm his body. There was a change that took place in them men. Previously undoubtedly self-righteous and looking down their nose at other people and now allowing the gospel to change them and now being one with the regular folk. Amen. I'm just saying. 
That's what we're all level at the cross. We might not all dress the same. We might not all have the same IQ. We might not all look. We might not all drive the same cars. Don't climb a car. Listen, but guess what? We are all level at the cross. Amen. Amen. So when we take communion, there are things that we must remember. And as we remember, the Holy Spirit will use them to change our hearts. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. I don't even want to turn to these scriptures, but listen. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 24 through 25, it says, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we were healed for you were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your soul. The sin of Adam had separated you from the presence of God, but Jesus, his own self, bare our sin in his own body on the tree. Amen. And now there's restoration that's been taking place and he's bringing us back to the presence of the Lord. Amen. Second thing I wanted you to know is that when you least deserved and he died for you, right. therefore, when people hurt you and then you feel like they least deserve it, you must ask for grace so that you can forgive them. That's what it says in Romans 5, 8. But God commends or shows his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When we were our worst, he died for us. You can expect people are going to hurt you. But the real Jesus in you is going to help you, if you ask him to, to truly have a love. Listen to me, I'm not trying to fake something. Yeah, I know sometimes we've got to fake it until we make it. But the fruit of the Holy Spirit will change you. Yes. If you allow it to happen, gee, the Holy Spirit will put love in your heart where there was previously bitterness. Mm -hmm. now, I can't make that happen. You can't make that happen, but God can. Yes. Jesus. That's why you know it's the fruit of the Spirit. Yeah. You know you didn't come up with that one. Mm -hmm. Boy, that wasn't me right there, huh? That was the Lord. Boy, I didn't like that person. <laughs> Last thing, he's coming back again, and when he does, we're going to rule with him, but also we will be like him. 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. There's going to come a day when we're going to see the King of kings and Lord of lords, and we're no longer going to have all these hidden darknesses and motives because the sin nature will be completely eradicated from us. We will finally be able to worship him as he deserves to be worshipped. Amen. Without all kind of crazy thoughts interrupting <clears throat> us and messing us up. Amen. But, and, and, but he's coming back again. And then when we take communion, let's go ahead and get started. When we take communion, that's what we're doing. We're remembering what the Lord has done. We're remembering the work of the Lord. Amen. I think you just got two different layers to this. If you peel off the plastic part and you take the bread. You know, the bread represents his sinless body. Whenever they make that matzah bread, the Jewish people, it's unleavened. And that's why it's flat. Because leaven is yeast. We call it yeast and Unleavened bread represents the sinless nature of Christ. In the Old Testament, when the, when the bread was unleavened, it meant it didn't have yeast. And yeast throughout the scripture represents sin. I mean, I don't have time to prove that to you. You'll just have to take my word for it. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, they couldn't have any leaven in their house. And in the New Testament, even Jesus said, Beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees, for it was full of leaven. And so... When we see this, this is representative of the sinless life and body of Jesus. This reminds us that we had gone astray. This reminds us that we were separated like that Peter passage said that we just read. That he came to bear our sins on his own body. That's just good theology. Right there. It makes perfect sense. That's why all the other stuff, all these false doctrines and stuff where they try to say, oh, Jesus was an angel and no, no, no. Angels didn't, work, didn't become a man to die for man. God became a man to die for man. Angels didn't sin. Yeah, they sinned against God, but they can't receive redemption. Mankind, God allows to receive grace and to be redeemed or to be bought back. The purchase price of the ransom was the sinless life of Jesus who bore our sin upon him. 
Father, we just thank you, Lord, for the fact that you gave us manna from heaven. We thank you that the manna from heaven, that even Jesus, you told Moses, you said that, uh, that, that Moses didn't give you this bread, but my Father in heaven gave you the living bread. You are that living bread, Lord. You give us hope. You, you came to earth to take our sin upon you, Lord. And your body was broken on our behalf. You were judged for us. Each and every one of us in this room, if we've, I know that we've given our heart to you, Lord. We love you. We desire to live for you. Oh, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to rightly discern your body. What that means to me is that we would understand how serious it was that you died for us. There's things in each and every one of our lives that we need you to deal with, Lord. And we know that the answer was what you did at the cross. Because that allowed your Holy Spirit, when we put faith in you, to live in us. It's what reveals truth to us. It's what stimulates our conscience and our soul. It's what reveals the things in our life that don't need to be there, Lord. And so we pray that you would deal with us and that you would help us and that you would heal us, oh Lord God. We ask that you would bless this bread as we take it together. And that, Lord God, we would be reminded of the, of the cross and the work that you did for us, Lord God. And as we eat it together, we ask you to bless it in Jesus' name. Let's eat the bread. Thank you, Jesus. Aaron, I'm going to ask you to pray for the cup, if you don't mind. And if everybody would just open their cup and be ready for after Aaron blesses the cup. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for your blood, Lord. The juice that we're going to drink today represents the blood that you shed at Calvary, Lord. And without the blood, Lord God, there's no remission for sins. There's no pardon for our penalty, Lord God. There's no freedom from the guilt and the shame that we carry in our sin, Lord. But because you were tied to the whipping post, and that post saturated in your blood, Lord, and the whip that was thrown across your back was saturated in your blood, Lord, representing the price, the full price that you paid through the giving of your life, Lord. We appeal, Lord God, to that sacrifice daily. We go back daily, Lord God. We deny ourselves when we go to the cross. Lord, we deny ourselves, Lord, when we look to your blood. We deny ourselves, Lord God. And we deny our way for freedom. And we deny our way, Lord God, to make things right. Lord, when we look to you, Father, and what you provided in your son Jesus and his blood and his sacrifice. We thank you, Lord God, that you did it. We thank you, Lord God, that when you did it, it was a one-time sacrifice that was complete. And although you died once and you sacrificed yourself one time, Lord God, we can go multiple times. We can go daily and multiple times in one day, Lord, if need be. We thank you for it, Lord God. We remember what you did, Lord God. We proclaim your death, Lord God, to one another, Lord God, to believers, Lord God. We declare what you did at the cross is everything to us, Father. And if there's anything in our hearts today, Lord God, that needs to be forgiven, Lord God, we can examine ourselves and we can make it right, Lord God, and we can find forgiveness. We thank you for what you did, Jesus, in your precious name. Amen. Thank you, Jesus.